Yes, yeah, so my, the talk I, I, I wanted to call Now is the Time to Prepare for Death. Um, and I wanted to call it that because that's just true, isn't it? Now, now is the time to prepare, pre prepare for death. Um, just recently, an, you know, somebody I first got involved with, who's about my age, died very suddenly. Um, death, we all know, it's the one thing we know for sure that it will happen. It's the one thing we know for sure will happen and we don't know when it will happen. Yeah. And because of those two great facts, it becomes the great mystery of life, doesn't it? It's the great problem, if you want to think of it like that, of life. Uh, that the one thing we most don't want to happen to us will happen to us, and we've no idea when or how. You know, that, that puts us in a terrifying position, you know. Um, I mean, the Buddha again and again in his teaching was trying to point out that samsara, as he'd call the ordinary world that we live in, ordinary consciousness, is a really, really dangerous place and you need to get out of it. Yeah? That, again and again he'd be saying, you're in a really dangerous place and you need to get out of it. And it's because he sees this fact of the inevitability of death and the uncertainty about when that will happen and indeed how that will happen, so vividly he realises the danger of it. The only way to solve the problem of death is to gain enlightenment. Um, enlightenment is the great solution to the great problem. And because of that, it's ineffable, unspeakable. Um, you can't ever say what enlightenment is. The more you think you know what it is, probably the further away you are. Um, but what we can say about it is that in the moment of enlightenment, it's called nirvana, um, you solve the mystery of death or death no longer is an issue somehow. So you have the nirvana, the um, enlightenment, and then tonight we're going to talk about the parinirvana, which just means enlightenment without remainder. Uh, remainder being the body. So that already makes it really clear that you've got um, enlightenment, which is this great solution to the problem of life, the problem of life being that it's going to end. Um, and once you've got that great solution, having a body or not is neither here nor there. So for the Buddha, the Parinirvana is not a big event. Yeah. The, the great moment in the, in, in the Buddha's life, clearly, is when he becomes a Buddha, when he gains enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. Then he has enlightenment, Nirvana, then he has Parinirvana, <coughs> and Nirvana without remainder. Yeah. So when we talk about the Buddha, Buddha's passing away or death or whatever, we're talking about the parinirvana, yes, yeah, something. Uh, if, there, if, if anything could be more mysterious than the enlightenment, the parinirvana for us is more mysterious. So I want to say a few thing, uh, things about the. Um, I've got the tiniest and most illegible. That, that's, those are my notes for this talk. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether you can see that, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> My, my retractor, I suddenly discovered retractable pencils and it stopped working and I, I took that as a sign that I wasn't to write it. Um, I'm not usually superstitious. Um, so I want to say a few things. Some of the, I mean, there's, there's two, the, the, the Parinirvana Sutra is a huge sutra, it's one of the most detailed sutras and I, I won't be able to say very much about it. I want to just pick out some of the, for me, the, 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 the salient points or rather the points in the story that I've always, I keep coming back to, I suppose I could say. And I want to talk mainly about three ways in which we can prepare for death. Um, because I think a very reasonable way of thinking of life, and an even more reasonable way of thinking of the Dharma life, is that it's preparing for death. That our life, if it's to be a genuine human life, needs to be a life that is a preparation for death, that makes sense in relationship to death. So much of what we do makes no sense in the relationship of death. Our petty arguments, our status seeking, our uh, obsessive competitiveness, our Facebook trolling, you know, most of it makes no sense at all given that you're going to die and you don't know when. So you could think of your life very much as being the value of life to make a human life is a human life that can stand alongside the fact of death. Yeah. And in a way, all of these 10 days, we've been trying to lead a life that you could put alongside death and say that was a really human, grown-up way of spending those 10 days. 
uh, when I could have been spending it in quite other ways. Yeah? So I'll just, I want to say three ways in which I think we could uh, prepare for death. Yeah? But I first want to start with a story. I, I slightly mistaken in my instruction, Donnie, so I'll start with the story, say three points, and then I'll go back to the story. So first of all, um, you know, you've got the Buddha teaching for 45 years, all carefully, you know, um, brought out by Pranya Manas last night. Incredible how much you managed to get into. Um, so there he is, he's walking around, and I really liked how Pranya Manas put it, that he um, just went to people and talked to them. In fact, often in sutras it says, I went to them and said, and that, that, that phrase occurs again and again, I went to them and said, which is interesting, I, he doesn't say, I sat around waiting for people to come and worship me. He says, I went to them and said. Yeah. Um, so I took an action, I went towards them, and I communicated with them. Mostly the Buddha's life is a life of friendship, of communication, of going to them and saying. Yeah. And uh, that's very, very precious to the Tree Ratna movement and order, is, the, is that attitude of communication, of friendship, of going to them and saying. Yeah. Um, that's what order members uh, are trying to live out, imperfectly, but trying to live out. So you have to imagine then that that, that's been happening for 45 years. So the Buddha's now in his 80s. I won't go through all the details of how he comes to die. He, um, there are stories of the Buddha's talking about his body being really, he said it's like an old cart tied together with string and belts and all that sort of thing. So and he clearly experienced physical pain, for instance. There are moments where Ananda, who's often described as his um, companion, which is really kind of slightly technical language, really it's his friend, is massaging his shoulders. And he'll even tell Ananda, you know, I've got all this physical pain, but it doesn't affect my mind at all. My mind is not affected by that, but I have got all this physical pain. So he's not, um, he's not kind of supernaturally above the human position. He, you know, his old body gets old, he says it's like an old cart, um, uh, you know, just strapped together with, with rope and belts. He gets aches and pains, he gets painful shoulders. Um, he asks a friend to massage his soldiers. You know, very, very human. Um, it doesn't affect his mind, though. None of that affects his mind. So you have to, there, he's wandering with Ananda, and in, in the Parinirvana Sutta, he goes, he makes, he, he knows he's going to enter Parinirvana, and he um, makes a last teaching tour, which basically means like he just, he just goes round places again and reiterates his dharma. Uh, he teaches a threefold way, mainly, which is what um, Pani Manas was emphasising last, uh, last night. So there he is, he's knowing he's going to die, from, in our language, it's not his language, our language, and uh, he just goes around and just makes sure everyone's clear about what he's teaching. And then he arrives at a certain place, and he says to Ananda, who hasn't realised that the Buddha is going to enter par Paranirvana, he says, um, this is where I'm going to attain my Paranirvana here. And uh, it's, a, it's like a, a nowhere place, a li little nowhere town in the big back of nowhere. Yeah? And it's a um, stone, stone kind of, just bit of stone, that was where the village elders would sit, between two twin sal trees, very tall, beautiful trees. But it would be where the the local village elders would sit and talk. Yeah? And they arrived at this place and the Buddha said, this is the place of my, going to, going to be the place of my parent of honour. And Ananda is incredibly, um, you know, upset by that, you know, distraught by that, and you know, begs the teacher to live and so on. But he says, no, this is where I'm going to enter parent of honour. And, uh, and one, what strikes me in this moment of the story is Ananda says, well, at the very least, let, don't die here in this like back of beyond, in this little mud hut town, you can't be dying here. You know, we need to go to Visali, we need to go, you can't be doing it here. You know, this is like, it's like dying in Solly Hall or something. Um, <clears throat> or Market Harbour or something like that, you know. Um, you know. It's like the Buddha gets to Market Harbour and, and says, I'm going to have my Paranivana. You think, no, it should have at least be Paris or Munich, you know. Um, can't be Solly Hall or, you know just outside Ledbury, you know. Um, uh, and I'm always, I've, I've always found that very significant, that the Buddha said, no, this is where I'm going to attain Paranormal. And Arnold's instinct is, well, this is just not a suit. Basically, he's trying to say, quite, 
you know, out of love and respect, this is just not a suitable place for a, a Buddha to die. This is just like a really ordinary, pretty, probably rubbishy place on the outskirts of that. This is not a place for a Buddha to enter Parinirvana. And what that, for me, symbolises is that there's no... That, 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 um, I don't know how I can quite... Exp- the ordinariness of place... Uh, it, it kind of connects in my mind when I first started writing poems I was reading Seamus Heaney and he, he, he lived in Anna Horish, I think is the name is you know as soon as you live in Anna Horish, you think well there's a poem straight away you hardly have to do anything um, <laughs> you know just to live there um, you know I was reading Auden and his mother used to play the whole score of Tristan and Isolde and get her and W.H. Auden her son to sing along you know and I'm thinking, I cannot imagine my mother doing anything remotely like that. You know, I remember first feeling I didn't have a poetic childhood. You know, you always feel that somebody else's life is significant. Um, you know, and it can be significant in all sorts of ways. It's so easy to think the place you come from, the person you are, the particularity of you, can't include the paranirvana, can't include the sacred, can't include... Uh, the transcendent, you see what I mean? I think that's the myth of that part of the story. Um, that there is no place that can't, can't include the transcendent. Yeah? There is no ordinary place that is not appropriate for the transcendent. There's no ordinary person um, that can't partake of this. Yeah? Um, you know, I come from just fairly near here, a place called Henley and Arden. Um, it's a really, really ordinary place, small town place with small town people. Um, and I used to feel so anti it in a certain way. Um, and now I feel rather affectionate to it. So the thing I draw from the place of the Paranirvana is that it's so, we, we, part of Buddhist practice, a large part of it, is seeing, understanding your particularity. So we're each of us particular. We're burdened by that in many ways. But we, so, I don't know whether about you, but I so often wish I was someone else. You know, like calmer, more intelligent, funnier, uh, deeper, better looking. <laughs> uh, so easy to wish you were someone else, to wish you didn't have your own particularities. But all of us, every single one of us, are a particular person from a particular place. And it's easy to feel that that can't be included in this effulgent glory. You know, um, Henley and Arden can't be included in this effulgent glory. Yeah? Um, my sort of smallnesses uh, and so on can't be... What, what can I be thinking, you know, even thinking about the Buddha, as if it could be anything to do with me? Yeah? So I think that little moment in the story is saying that you've, you get to the transcendent, to the effulgent glory as I'm rather grandly talking about at the Paranirvana, through the ordinary, <laughs> through this out-of-the-way place. There's no, that's no less sacred, no less um, tra- uh, possessing the capacity for transcendence as anything else, anywhere else. And that's true of each and every one of us. Um, it's saying that there's something about your life, which if you go deeply enough into your life, with enough rigour and enough um, curiosity and enough... Um, Honesty, self-honesty, you'll find your way to the transcendent through your particularity. There's no other way of doing it. There isn't isn't an abstract general that you can be. You're always particular. And the way to something more than your particularity is through your particularity. And that doesn't mean accepting it. It means trying to see its deeper instincts and patterning and trying to go deeper even than that. So what happens is that then the Buddha lies on this seat um, with, between these two twin soul trees and um, the Buddha says to Anna to gather everyone because I'm going to enter Paranirvana, uh, gather all my disciples and so on. And you, you, you get this incredible gathering, you quite often see this in Chinese painting particularly, um, of the Buddha sitting, lying like this. It's, when you first see it, it looks like he's watching telly or something. <laughs> Uh, it's extre- the, the posture of a parent of Arnold Buddha is extremely relaxed. It looks almost casual, um, probably c- cultural for us, but 
it's difficult. To t it doesn't look grand at all. Um, you're just riding on one arm like that, one hand like that. And uh, he's then surrounded by his um, disciples. Uh, he's also then, you can imagine, news gets out. So the villagers come. Um, everyone that hears about him, everyone's heard about him and could get there, tries to get there. Yeah. So you have to imagine this vast crowd around the Buddha who's just lying down with his um, head on his hand like that. And according to the tradition, um, not only do humans come, um, but the natural world comes, so all the animals come. They, they also want to be there. Um, so the whole natural world uh, uh, comes to, to witness the Parinirvana. Not only that, but the supernatural world comes. Ghosts and demons and wood sprites um, and gods. And the, uh, according to the story, the, 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 the sky is full of gods. They, they're called devas, which just means beings of light. So that the sky is full of being, beings of light. And the Buddha even says that if you had a little a hair from a horse's tail, you couldn't prick it into any part of the sky that isn't full with devas, isn't full with kind of angels, really. Yeah. So you imagine this incredible scene of an old man, he's in his 80s, a worn-out human body lying on this stone couch with these two trees um, either side of him, great, tall, beautiful trees in this soul grove, surrounded by these disciples, surrounded by villagers, surrounded by more and more people, surrounded by animals, uh, birds coming to perch on the trees, um, by ghosts, by demons, by gods. So the whole universe turns to look at uh, the Buddha. The whole universe turns around him to look at him. There's a marvellous little moment in the sutra where somebody is fanning the Buddha. From, he stands in front of him, fanning him. And uh, the Buddha says, could you move aside? And it sort of sends this ripple around the crowd because everybody's watching him. And he moves this man away. And someone asks Ananda, why did he ask him? To, it's, it's apparently he's a very faithful disciple of the Buddha as well, an old faithful disciple. You know, quite right thinking, he's, he's got probably a fever, let me fan him to keep him comfortable. And the Buddha says, can you step aside? And uh, somebody asks Ananda, why did he do that? And Ananda asks the Buddha, and the Buddha says, well, all of these devas, all of these gods, all of these beings have come from all over the universe to come and see my Parinirvana. And they're getting irritated because there's this monk standing in the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I very, you know, she said, would you ever just mind? <laughs> um, which is exquisite. And he's saying, they can't see me, they want to see me. Uh, which I always find exquisite. He's not saying, I can't see them. He's saying, they've come to see me and someone's standing in front of me. So I ask, that's why I ask them to move. So what I take, how I understand that image, and I think it's, I don't think you need to understand it. I think the image itself is really quite exquisite. Um, it's interesting, it occurs again and again in Japanese art. Um, it's, it's an image of a perfected community. It's an, a vision, effectively, of heaven on earth. Um, you know, it's, it's that old legend of animals no longer fighting each other. You know, human beings in full concord with each other. Um, a universe that's now, for a moment, completely focused and harmonious. It's what we all deeply yearn for. And we, we human beings come up with images that match what we deeply yearn for. But what it's saying, if we, if we want to read it in that dreadful what it's saying kind of way, is um, that this has got cosmological significance. This, has got un this is a universal moment. This isn't, the, uh, I'm going to say an ordinary death. There's no such thing, thing as an ordinary death. This isn't a death as we understand it, is a probably better way of putting it. Um, it's a universal moment. The whole of the universe is gathered around this moment. Um, it's, an, it's this incredible uh, picture and the other thing that I take from it you know, because I really like this fact about the animals I remember telling this story to this uh, to school children once they came to the LBC I remember this many years ago and I told the story and I said I'll tell you this story and it's a true story and they, all these children they were lovely little, they were about six and I said it's a true story so, and I said all these animals came 
But one animal didn't cry. Do you know which animal it was? And they were like, <sighs> and somebody said the crocodile. I said, no, the crocodile did cry, actually. But said, what about a horse? And, uh, no, I said, the horse is crying. And then no, everyone was like waiting. It's a lovely, a lovely atmosphere of children attending. And I said, it was the cat. The cat didn't cry. And that's why they got a bad press in Buddhism. And everyone was like, oh. And then suddenly this little girl just said, hang on, animals don't cry. <laughs> and I said, uh, no, no, they don't. <laughs> and she said, but you said it was a true story. Uh, I said, yeah, but it's like symbolic. <laughs> Get me out of here. She, was like a per she couldn't have timed it better. She said, hang on, animals don't cry. <laughs> the whole magic would... <laughs> Really funny. I thought I had to do this terrible backing down. So, well, you know, symbolism is like terribly important. <laughs> <laughs> Be very careful of trying to teach children. Um, but what, what I think all that story of the animals means um, is that the universe is alive. Yeah, the universe is alive. Everything is alive. Um, this is absolutely central to, I think it's central to Buddhist ethics. It, it's our rising of our deep sense of animism, of the, the aliveness of things, that human ethics can arise. Do you remember when you were a child, you would, you would sometimes kick something because you'd run and tell it off for what, running into a tree or something? I remember when Alex was about three, I went to see the, these trees that were dying, and I howled her up into the tree and I said, look, it's dying, go over and talk about it. And we walked off and she turned around and said, bye-bye tree, hope you get better soon. Uh, um, and it's a very deep instinct in human beings that things are alive. And if we're not careful, we just lose it, that instinct, and then we can destroy things. Conveniently, we can then just destroy things. And of course, the most terrifying aspect of that is we can stop remembering that each other are alive. Um, and we, human beings have done that all the way through history. Very often, tribes... Their word for them, their own tribe is our equivalent of human, and their word for the other tribe is our equivalent of it. Yeah? And you it them, and then you can destroy them. Yeah? You, c you can find all sorts of ways, ideologies find all sorts of ways to dehumanise people and therefore hurt them. Like one of the things about the Holocaust, for instance, is that the language of privilege, you know, that saying that the Jewish people are very privileged, was one of the ways in which they dehumanised them and therefore could kill them, because they're privileged people, so it's all right to kill them. It's interesting, even language of privilege can become a way of dehumanising someone. So this image is an image of a universe that's alive. Trees are alive, water's alive, mud is alive, the sky is alive. Everything's glittering with consciousness. Um, it's not me being the conscious subject and then this dead matter. If you've got a world like that, you, haven't, you can't have Buddhism. Not in a world where you think you're the living one and everything else is dead. Yeah. That, that is, that's, that's, a, that's, not, that's a, a world in which Buddhism can never thrive. So you've got this incredible animistic sense that everything is alive. And it's alive in the way that you're alive. And therefore there's a resonance between you and a tree, between you and the sky, between you and the mouse and the bird. Yeah? And if you don't feel that resonance, that's a serious human issue. Yeah? That's a serious human issue. The more you're on retreat, very often what you start to notice is that resonance. Sometimes quite surprisingly. You suddenly look at a tree, or today I was walking with Ben, and then suddenly there was a robin near us. Where's Ben gone? There was a, a little robin near us, and it, because we were quiet, it wasn't frightened. And um, there's an immediate res resonance. You don't just think, oh, there's one of those little red-breasted things. There's that little flutter of resonance, as if to say, I, you and I are a little bit alike. You, Robin, and I, a little alike. I, I've got a bit of Robin in me, and you've got a bit of human in you. Yeah? Um, that's absolutely crucial to Buddhist thought, that everything is alive, uh, the universe is alive. So you have to imagine that incredible drama, and then, as Pranyamala said, um, Ananda is so overcome with um, pain and sorrow at losing his friend. They've been friends, really, since they were children. Um, he goes away and weeps. He doesn't want to disturb the Buddha, which again is exquisite courtesy. Uh, he, he doesn't, which I think sometimes gets missed that Arnold does very well that the whole thing is about the Buddha. He doesn't want his weeping to detract from the, the attention to the Buddha, to the Lord as he calls him. 
So he goes off and weeps. And the Buddha suddenly notices that he's not there. And I, even in that, you see, you've got this incredible, if you imagine the scene, you know, you have to imagine it with all these serried ranks, people going off into the darkness, the, the sky full of spots of light and angels. And in all that cosmological drama, an animist sense of the universe being alive, he <coughs> notices that his friend's not there. He just says, hang on, where's, where's, where's Amanda? And uh, someone says to him, he's so upset he's gone away to cry. And he says, well, go and bring him back, call, call him back. Yeah? Uh, Prajna Manas uh, said to him yesterday that, that, that Ananda was saying, he who was weeping and weeping and saying, I'm losing my friend, he who was so kind. Yeah? That's the thing he remembers. So the Buddha asked him to come back, and the meeting between them there is just exquisite. He says, he says something like this to Ananda. He says, Ananda, have I, not, have I not told you that all things are impermanent? I told you that. I've been teaching you that all this time. Um, that's what it's like. That's this life of ours. It's, it's just life. Um, but it's, it's, it's in this, how you feel it when you read the t in the text, this exquisite tone of, um, not admonition, but of kind of reminder. But you remember, you remember this, death, you remember. You know, um, and then what he does, he rejoices in Ananda, in front of everyone. He says, oh, Ananda is so good at this. He rejoices in them. Um, and, and that rejoicing, in a way, you could almost imagine as being the kind of core of a rejoicing merits practice that runs through our movement, like in our team meetings every day. A lot of what we've been doing in our little team meeting after supper is just rejoicing in each other, um, just saying what we like about each other. It's such a positive uh, thing to do. But you can imagine it starting with the Buddha, rejo uh, uh, the great exemplar of Buddhism, rejoicing in Ananda, this great disciple. And the humanity, what I want to, to bring out about that is in that cosmological drama, this exquisite humanity. Yeah? So that the, the, the universal doesn't take away from the particular, and the particular doesn't take away from the universal. That if they become the same, if you look at them deeply enough. Yeah? Um, I think that's what, why it, for me, it stays in my mind. And then the Buddha says, I'm about, I'm, you know, are there any last questions? I've been teaching for 45 years. Is there anything you're not clear about? Yeah. Um, is there anything you don't understand about my Dharma? Yeah. Um, and he asks this to the great assembly, and it's silent. And uh, the Buddha waits, and then he says, um, you, might, you, you might find it a bit difficult to ask me questions just now. Um, I can see this would be a difficult moment to ask me a question just now. So if you, if you do have questions but you're too shy to ask or you feel too, um, it's difficult to ask, why don't you ask a friend to ask me? Um, then, and then he waits again. And what strikes me again about that is, is the Buddha's exquisite courtesy. That there he is entering his Paranavana and he can imagine unto other people so much as to remember that this is probably a quite a difficult time for you to ask a question. Um, so why don't you ask a friend and they can ask me a question. Yeah? Um, so you can see from those, just those little tiny bits from the Maha Parinivana Sutra, you can see that... Um, what can you see? I've forgotten. <laughs> you can see something. Um, oh yes, I remember. <laughs> You can see that this is why I should have written my talk. Um, <laughs> you can see that, um, that, that the Buddha is the most prepared for death. Yeah. He's, it's not an issue for the Buddha. He's, he's, he solved death 45 years ago. So he can ask somebody to move away from fanning him. He can um, ask someone to ask a friend to ask a question because his whole concern is with you, not with him. Yeah because he's a Buddha, so he has no egotism. So his consciousness, mis completely mysterious consciousness, um, is a consciousness of you. Yeah? Um, so he's the one who's prepared for death. Now is the time to prepare for death. He's the exemplar of preparing for death. Um, so I want to say how we might do that, and then I'll finish the story. Yeah? Um, 
So I've got three ways in which I think we can prepare for death. The first one and, uh, is that we look at our views, yeah? that we uh, examine very, very carefully our views. Yeah? Our views. Um, by views, I don't mean opinions, uh, little factoids, or things you might post on Facebook, um, although they, it includes that. Um, it means much more like your deep assumptions, uh, what Karl Popper would call your pre-conscious theory. That's how Popper uses the, the German philosopher Karl Popper. He talks about your pre-conscious theory, that you come into life with a theory already, in other words, with a view already, with a belief system. Yeah? Uh, you don't, you're not very conscious of that, but you enter into life with a belief system. It's, it's in you, and it's given to you. It's given to you by your parents, by your teachers, by the, the sort of playground that you're in, How, whether that's a literal playground or a, a work playground or a drinking playground or whatever it is. Yeah? Um, you, you, there's no such thing as existence, there's no such thing as experience without view. There isn't a place that you can go where you don't have views. Well, there is, actually. I get that that's slightly wrong. There is one place, and that's to become a Buddha. The Buddha has no views. Yeah. Um, um, but he's the only one, I'm afraid. Everyone else, you're looking at life through a view. <laughs> the only way you can think about life is through a view. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to get this sense of what I mean by view. It's a, a deep, pre-conscious patterning, belief pattern. So, you know, if we were to be in a spacecraft and go 200 years ago, we'd all believe in God. We would never have questioned that particularly. Um, it would just seem self-evidently true. Um, if somebody, you know, like someone like Shelley would write again, you know, an, a, a tract about atheism, it, you know, it was absolutely scandalous. You know, people were like, they just couldn't believe that he would say such a thing. It was just like against all common sense as far as he was concerned. Now, it's easy to see in older cultures that they have a view. But it's very, very difficult to see that we have a view. So if we then come 200 years back again to us, you know, one of our views, for instance, is that you need to think for yourself. Um, so it's a very simple but basic view. It's actually very recent. Uh, it's actually somebody else's idea as well. It's not yours. Um, yeah, I can't remember which philosopher it is, but it's, it's, it's a definite moment in philosophy where you start to get that view coming in. You, it's not your view. Um, you just picked it up like a kind of virus. Um, yeah? So you, there's, we always have view, and you've either got views that are unhelpful, or you've got views that are helpful, or, if you're a Buddha, you've got no view. Right. Um, there's so much to explore about it, I, I, won't, I don't have time to, but the thing that's been striking me is that view creates culture. Um, any culture that you're in is an expression of views. So, you know, investment banking, that culture that Donna Utah was in, you know, staying up late, all those work, the high heels, the whole thing, is all based in a set of views about what it means to be alive, what's of value, like you were talking about cynicism earlier on in the retreat, what's, what, what gets you ahead in the world, what's a real thing to attain to, uh, and so on. I remember going to teach mindfulness at an at a investment bank, and, and uh, it was like a fashion show. You know, I, I've never seen so much hair, you know. <laughs> so I didn't know you, you could do so much with hair. It's all like big curly jobs. All the men looked like they'd been in the gym most of the time and had these incredible suits. And all the women had this hair. <laughs> it's true. It sort of tossed it in. Um, and then some of them admitted to me how unhappy they were. Um, but it's all based on a view. Or, you know, you go back to Nazi Germany. That's always the one that people go back to. And of course, when we think about that, we always put ourselves as the goody person who hides the Jewish people in the, in the wherever it is, a, a cellar. Um, but we're probably much more likely to be the you're, you're everyday fascist, really. Because we can, what happens is that view creates a culture, and human beings, unconsciously mainly, conform to the culture that they're created by. Uh, Prani Manus touched on this in his talk about his life, even. All of us, are a product, a, a product of a view system which creates a culture which we instinctively um, mould our, well, it, it, it moulds our actions. Yeah? So view creates culture, culture moulds our actions. 
Yeah? We can act in terrible ways, ways that you could, unimaginably awful ways, because of a view. You know, the classic one is uh, witchcraft, which is really just burning old ladies at the stake. I can't remember, it's something like 70,000 70, of them, quite recently, historically, just because of an idea that people could do unspeakable things to human beings because of a view. Yeah? The, the, the difficulty is, is realising that we're in the same position um, and especially we are when we come to this question of death. We have a view about it. We don't know anything about death. I don't, you don't, your friends don't, um, the scientists don't, um, the rabbi doesn't, um, you name it, that no one knows. What we've got is different views about it, or to put it less politely, different beliefs about it. So if you believe that death is the end, and that's you know, complete end, then it creates a whole kind of attitude to death and a whole kind of attitude to life. You don't have experience of death. What you have is a view about it. Um, so one of the things we really need to do if we are to prepare for death is really explore our views. And that, in my experience, is very challenging. It's very challenging. So one of my views I had, golly, look at the time, one of the uh, uh, views I had is that I was a victim um, I come from a small town. I was gay. I still am, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Fat like a good it does me. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but never mind. Um, um, I'll leave you to wonder what I meant by that. Um, you know, so being gay for me when I was growing up was very, very, very difficult. Um, it, it was, um, you know, I've got three very macho older brothers who were quite cruel to me when I was a child. I was very sensitive. Um, so I grew up partly because of my brothers who are perfectly decent people there's nothing wrong with them but they're lovely guys in fact if you meet them it looks like just me again but two more times <laughs> uh, one of them swears much more um, um, so I had this feeling that I was a victim and I, fa I could find evidence for that everywhere you know I grew up with feeling bullied I grew up with thinking that people's ag aggression was other people's not mine I grew up with a strong sense of feeling a victim, and I was quite good at bringing out that story and getting sympathy, which is kind of dangerous. It's actually David Mitra particularly that helped me with that. David Mitra very kindly became a, took, sort of became my friend when I was very, very young, and really challenged me on that uh, in a very kind way, but managed to break me out of that sort of, that sort of view that I was a victim. And what, you, what happens once you have a view like that is you keep seeing life in those in, in, that, in that way. You keep getting it confirmed. What your view does is it um, anything that meets, agrees with that view gets heightened. Things that don't agree with that view you don't notice. Yeah. So if you think people don't like you, every time somebody doesn't look at you in the silence, it makes you think, oh, I'm right to think that. But every time someone does look at you in the silence, you'll, you'll find a way of dismissing that or minimising that. <laughs> Our, our view creates our life. Mind precedes world. So if we're going to prepare for death, good heavens, we really need to explore our views. <coughs> and the, the classic way of doing that in Buddhism is to study the Dharma. Yeah? Is, to, is to try to discover where we've got views that are an unhelpful and limit our life, liber liberate ourselves to views that are helpful and discover from there uh, no view. My, my, my closest touch to no view, uh, I was mentioning in my group, I think it's only occurred to me in this retreat that that's what it might have been, a tiny, tiny brush of no view, was sitting next to my father after he died. I was on a weekend retreat, I remember, I remember my brother calling me, um, and I remember, I don't smoke, but I went, and, I went and bought a pack of cigarettes, got on the train, trying to uh, smoke myself out of experience, I suppose. Um, sorry if that's a shock. Um, <clears throat> I can talk to you about it afterwards. Um, and I remember I rang my brother from some awful station like Mark Peterborough, I think. You know, I, was a, I think I'd got to somewhere like that. And I rang him on this station platform and he burst into tears, which my brother never does. My brother don't do that. He burst into tears and he's just died. And there I was on this platform. You know, it's, again, it's a bit like the place of the, para, the Paranirvana, there was the place. The place that I hear that my father has just died. He, he said, he's, he's just stopped breathing. And there I was on this platform with the smell of bad pies and uh, the wind and the cold. 
and, and I was on my own. Yeah, there was the place. And I got back, and you know, he'd been dead for an hour or two when I got back. And I just sat next to him, and I had no. I sat. I remember feeling, I don't know what's happened. I have no idea what's happened. But usually, when we say that, we think we do. We think he's died, and that's the end. I, that seemed just as ridiculous as anything else. In that moment, in that pure moment, that idea that he was dead, that it's like a machine that stopped working, we may as well just chuck it away, seemed just as ridiculous as the idea he'd gone to heaven or the idea he'd gone to hell. He probably, actually, the most likely thing, he'd gone to the shed. <laughs> That's another thing. Um, <laughs> um, but I rem it, was, it was like a, it was a, little, a moment in my life where I had no view. I had purely no view. I didn't know, and it was like, it was like holiness. Yeah, it was like holiness. So that's my first area. I'll try and speed up with my second ones. So the second thing we need to do to prepare to death is renounce life, um, quite clearly. Um, the second thing we need to do, if, we're, if now is the time to prepare to death, is to practice renunciation. Um, pr practice renunciation of the world um, and everything in it. Um, so just when you were thinking this might not be a feel-good feel talk, <laughs> you've arrived at the, the least feel-good moment. Um, um, I was remembering, Wittgenstein, I think, said that the meaning of the world lies beyond the world, which is a posh way of saying um, that in ordinary egotistical con con uh, consciousness, you will not find the meaning of things. In our ordinary world of getting and spending, in our everyday consciousness, in our worldly attitudes to success, failure, happiness, unhappiness, love, um, etc., all of that stuff, um, you know, born, career, re retire, die, no, you'll never find the meaning in all that. Yeah. I'm afraid that is the Buddha's message. It's a world-destroying message. It's saying that there is meaning in life, but it's not to be found in that, at that level. Um, there's much more to, I could say about that to nuance that, but I won't have time. I mean, basically, that, that renunciation is quite difficult to talk about because it needs a, a high degree of wisdom to practice it. You need to know how to much to renounce and how soon, and you need to do it very, very intelligently and, ta and, and wisely. Actually, you've already done it. You, you're, you've renounced all sorts of things just by coming here. You know, you could be at home watching bad television. You could be at home with an evening on Netflix. You could be preparing for an absolute blinder tomorrow night, you know. <laughs> but you've ren effectively, without you noticing it, is you've renounced all that to do this, to do this otherworldly thing, to do a retreat. And a retreat is a retreat from the world, yeah? That's what you've already decided to do. So you've already started renouncing. And you see how, the sp in a way, you can feel it now, the spiritual renunciation is an ascetic spirit. It's a human spirit. It feels like when you're renouncing that life is more meaningful, more beautiful, there's more friendship, there's more humanity, there's more animism, there's more nature, there's more robins. You know, um, but if you try and explain that to people, you just think, well, you didn't do much you know, on your retreat. You know, well, that is like the whole point. You know. So it's, it's quite difficult to talk about uh, wisdom, sort of why, uh, sorry, um, renunciation wisely, because I've seen people overdo it, and I've seen people underdo it. Um, in the movement, I think at sometimes in the past people overdid it. At the moment, we're in danger of underdoing it. Yeah. It's, it's one of those subjects that's not very palpable. Um, so the, the, the three main things that we attach to that we need to renounce, just to keep it a bit um, strong. <laughs> The three main things we attach to is people, objects, and ideas. Yeah? So when we talk about renouncing the, view, the world, when we talk about renunciation, we're talking about, I think the first thing I want to say is renun the renunciation of a worldly attitude. Yeah? Which, I don't know about you, but as I get older, I find that kind of worldly attitude really quite disgusting. Um, kind of pig-like, you know, where all you're interested in is having fun for yourself, being cool, being successful, um, I mean, I suppose it's fine enough, but as you get older, it's very, very thin. It's, it's all right, I think, when you're young, up to when you're 35, it's understandable. After then, it looks, it's not a good look. <laughs> I saw my brothers once dancing at my niece's wedding, you know, doing that 
near the, you know, thing like this, with all their belly, beer buttons, you know, beer bellies, and I thought this is really not a good look. <laughs> you know, re get out now, you know, before you're a, a fat uncle. Um, I mean that in a really nice way. Um, <laughs> So I'll just say a little tiny bit about these three areas. So, of course, the sharp end of people is love and romance. Um, this is a very, very difficult one, I think. Um, you know, I've been in a relationship uh, since before I was a Buddhist. He's now had two children, which is like, I, I, I should get funding or something. <laughs> um, or at least be on Panorama or something. Um, um, so actually, my, my objects of attachment have kind of multiplied, but I've done nothing to deserve it. <laughs> um, you know, and I love them all very much. I love Gary very much. I love the girls very much. The girls a bit more than Gary nowadays. Um, <laughs> but I remember once when I was young, I did, not long after I'd come along to the centre, I, you know, I'd been 27 or something, I remember going up to see him. You know, he's lovely, Gary. He's, he's very handsome when he was young. It's not so bad now. He's, he's, it doesn't look as old as me, which is good. Um, and I remember coming back on the tube, I had this lovely evening with him, you know, sex and everything, I'm sorry to mention that. Um, <laughs> but we are among grown-ups, there's no children here. Um, and I remember getting, coming on the tube, get back home, and I remember it, it's one of those things at the moment, at the time you think, well, that's just a little thought, but it stayed in, I can remember exactly where I was, I can remember the atmosphere of it. I remember thinking, and it's changed nothing at all. I was really looking forward to seeing him. You know, I had a great time with him. He's a lovely guy. And I got back on the tube and I thought, and all the issues of life are just the same. They're just the same. And tell you what, I wish that wasn't true. I really wish that wasn't true. I wish that we walk off into the horizon and it's, you know, sunset and... Mm, oh, no, no. <laughs> Thank God I found you. <laughs> I really wish. Um, but it's, it's not like that. And, um, you know, part of, a, part of you know, sort of managing that, I think, is finding a way of having relationships that don't become the be-all and end-all of your life, where you put everything into that. And, of course, when that goes wrong, your whole life goes wrong. You haven't got a life suddenly. I've known friends who literally their life just breaks apart. They haven't got a life anymore. You know, their friends take sides. It can be really quite terrible, can't it? Um, the recriminations between each person, uh, using children as ammunition really quite, quite dreadful. Um, so I think probably the start of renunciation in terms of people is finding a way of having relationships. Most people want them. Um, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with relationships. Uh, but trying to make it so that they're, they're not the be-all and end of your life, that they're not your career, they're not what gives your life its meaning and substance, because that's not going to work. You'll get on the tube next morning and all the issues are the same as ever because the issues are primarily to do with your mind. Yeah? Lots more I could say about that, but you could discuss it tomorrow. Um, the, third, the third way, so that's, my, I think, a second way to prepare for death, is to renounce life. Um, renounce, uh, renounce a worldly attitude. Um, go forth, is the Buddhist language, from the world. Yeah? It's interesting, actually, one of the things, probably the thing we're most identified with is ideas. Objects, sometimes people can quite happily get rid of objects. I mean, that, that's worth doing in itself, I think, getting rid of objects. Um, you know, when sometimes people give me things, I just think, you know, someone's going to deal with this after I die. You know, we just ma amass objects whilst other people are starving. It just is so un inhuman to do that. Um, but really, for many of us, the real issue is ideas. We get very, very attached to ideas, and very often ideas that hurt us and hurt other people. Yeah. Anyway, lots more to say about that, but that, I think, is the second way to prepare to, for death, is to renounce the world. Yeah. But not in a kind of small-minded, nar narrow, uh, kind of bad religious way. That's actually a, a sort of perversion of that. Um, it's realising that the meaning of the world lies beyond the world. And you kind of already know that. You don't really need me to tell you. Um, it's not in success, it's not in money, it's not in romance, it's not in objects, uh, it's not in ideas. Um, but the third area, the final area I want to talk about is love. Yeah? So we, the first view area I said is that we need to explore our views because our views create our world. 
our views shape, create culture, and culture shapes our actions. Yeah? Secondly, we need to renounce a worldly attitude, which, especially as you get older, has got so little dividends for you. It really has. I mean, that's slightly what I mean about fat lot of good being gay does to me. Now. It's no good to me now. It was great when I was young and I could sleep around, but it gives me very little now. Um, what I need to do now is devote myself to a much, much higher good. Yeah? Uh, so you renounce worldly attitudes. But the third thing, of course, is that we need to love. That's the other way to prepare for death. These are all, and I put all of these three together. So um, I want to say a word about self-love and a word about Sangha, and then I'll, I'll conclude going back to the story. I've gone a bit over time. Uh, so one of the things that I came into the movement with and that David Mitra, again, was very kind to help me with, um, and David Mitra's kindness, I don't know whether you've experienced it yet, is, is quite, it's quite, he, he's never, ever patronised me. I met him when I was 25. You know, he, was a, uh, he was a friend of Bantes, you know, a very senior order member. He's never in his life patronised me. And when I was in difficulty, he could be really kind, really, really kind. And when I needed challenging, he would challenge me. And looking back on it, I sometimes didn't meet that challenge very courteously. Um, but I'm really glad that I was challenged, because I would have just stayed in that little Helen Arden gay boy thing. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, uh, so one of the things that I came into the movement with is a, you know, that classic kind of self-hatred. I found my experience of myself difficult. I, I've never been talented at happiness. I've always found... You know, people talk about happiness. It's just never been a talent of mine. If you just, um, some people seem to be good at it, don't they? Um, I never was. Even as a child, I remember... Um, yeah, I just remember feeling... Um, I was just so unhappy. My brothers were always strapping lads, grinning. My sister was... Every photograph, she's smiling and beaming away. And I'm always crying in every family photograph. <laughs> I, I always seem to be cold, and I always seem to be crying. And my mother used to always say... What's the matter now? Um, what, and uh, what's the matter now? And sometimes when I'm in a bad mood, I say to myself, what's the matter now? You know, you could, I could, my parents didn't know what to do with me. You know, um, so I grew up with a, a sense of being a problem, uh, a sense that there was something wrong with me. You know, and you know, that classic kind of self-hatred. Um, and... Uh, I try to sort of deal with that by exploring the inner child and all that sort of thing. I never personally, for me, found it worked. Um, I remember having a very vigorous conversation with David Mitchell about it. And I, I never found all that kind of approach to myself worked. What I found worked was growing a better tree. Um, in Buddhism, we have this idea of the good tree and the poison tree. And I had quite a substantial poison tree in my life. And it's still there. Yeah? Uh, if I'm tired, if I'm stressed, if I get criticised a lot... Uh, my poison tree rears up, as it were. I can see it much more clearly. And you can do something with the poison tree, and you have to do something with it. I've had to do something with that poison tree. You know, I've got a very strong tendency to self-pity. I've got a very critical mind, um, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go on about it. Um, I've got a poison tree, like you have, yeah? And what's mainly helped me is to grow a different tree, yeah? I do a bit of pruning on the poison tree. The poison tree is like a management issue. <laughs> Uh, which basically says, I'm a management issue. Um, but what I've tried to do is grow a better tree, grow the good tree. In other words, um, I think that you love yourself when you're loving. Uh, there's a poet that I'm going to be interviewing in January, John Burnside, and he's, he talks about we love ourselves when we love. So he says, whether it's, a do whether it's you love a dog, whether it's love the, the area you come from, whether it's love your family, whether it's love your partner, whether it's love whatever... That's, why you, that's how you love yourself. You love yourself by noticing yourself loving others. Yeah? That's how you discover self-love, is to give to other people and realise you've got things to give. That's the thing that changed things for me. It's, as time, very, very gently, over many years, and really coming in with quite crippling self-hatred, as well as lots of other things like showing off a lot, <laughs> um, uh, What's really helped, I think, is being able to give more, and then I suddenly realise I've got something to give, and that, makes, that changes my self-esteem. And when I can help other people or love other people, I suddenly think I can love and I can help, and that has changed my self-esteem. That's how I've cultivated self-love. 
So I think that might be our first area of love. Our second area is to create Sangha. It's to create a community of men and women who are in interacting very vividly with each other, who give each other permission to interact vi vividly with each other, who enter into the, each other's lives, who um, become friends with each other. The great relationship in Buddhism is friendship. That's what Buddhism really holds up and, and, uh, and cherishes and, uh, uh, and speaks about so, so beautifully, is friendship. And uh, really important that friendship is something, uh, it's something challenging, it's something loving, it's something that never ends. It's not like mates. One of the dangers, it's probably particularly for men, I think, is you end up with mates. We're not friends, you end up with mates. People who agree with you, do that joshy thing. Um, it's very common amongst men. I don't know what happens with women, but mates, and, it's, and mates are a kind of inoculation against friendship. Yeah? I've even seen it's possible in Buddhism. You can turn Buddhism into a, like a cool matey thing, you know, like a frappuccino, decaf, soya, kind of vegany, matey, kind of doody, you know, five rhythmy kind of thing. You know, um, and I'm sure that has its place, but it's like really small. Um, the main thing about that is a kind of inoculation against real friendship. And what a shame, because there is such a thing as real friendship, and it's a wonderful thing. I'm, one of the great benefits in my life is I've got good friends in my life. That's a wonderful thing. And that's affecting, that's shone back into my self-esteem, my troubled self-esteem. So we need to create a sangha, and then we just need to just love people as much as possible. Any old person that you come upon, you, know, you just try to love them. You don't need to like them, you don't need to agree with them, you just need to love them. Yeah? So I think those are the three ways that we prepare for death, is that we examine our views, because views create culture, culture fashions our actions. We renounce worldly perspective, because we'll never find meaning and true satisfaction in that. Uh, and that we love others, especially we create friendships, especially we create sangha, and then we just love anyone and everyone and everything that we come upon. That's our way of preparing for death. But we left the Buddha already mastering all of that, mastering it so long ago, lying there between these twin sal trees. And he then just says, all conditioned things are impermanent. With mindfulness, strive on. Yeah? Those are his last words. And I think it's quite possible they are literally his last words. It wouldn't surprise me if everybody was waiting to hear what he'd say at the end, and I bet you they all memorised it. And I bet you that might be the one sentence of the whole Pali Canon that's word for word. Yeah. Um, all conditioned things are impermanent, with mindfulness strive on. And then when he said that, these twin sal trees, the, uh, uh, either side of, his, of the bench where he's lying, um, spring into untimely blossom. They suddenly flower out of season, yeah? And they rain petals down upon the Buddha, the, 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 the Buddha's Parinibbana. This wonderful final offering of petals falling on the Buddha. And I imagine that the whole huge assembly stretching in every direction, up and down and across, completely silent, and all you can hear is those, the, the, the sound of falling petals, all these white, white and pink petals falling on the body of the Buddha. And of course, when you think about those petals, you go back to the Enlightenment. Because Mara's armies, their weapons were turned into flowers. So what you had there was weapons being transformed into flowers. Now you've just got flowers. In the Buddha's Parinirvana, there's nothing to transform. Thank you.